talk about all things birds, how to identify them and how to record them on the uh, amazing Aussie Backyard Bird Count app, which is uh, free to download. Uh, webinar will also be recorded, so if you aren't able to stay for the whole recording or if you have any friends that you think might like to watch it later, you, we can always share the link later on. And before we go any further, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. Uh, it's a very special week on the calendar, National Bird Week. Um, it's a great week to raise awareness of birds in Australia and some of the threatened species and what we can all do to look after them and some of the conservation efforts that are happening to look after our birds around Australia. And also it's a really great way for people to get together and share their knowledge of birds, share their sightings and um, yeah, just spend 20 minutes a day getting out into your backyard or somewhere local where you can um, spend 20 minutes to sit quietly and enjoy listening to birds and recording them and noticing other things that you might see, which is also great for uh, mental health and well-being as well. So along the way, during the web webinar, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to use the chat uh, option in uh, Zoom and also the Q&A option. And it'd be really great. Uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any comments or questions for our special guests. Um, it'd also be great if you could uh, just put a comment of where you're tuning in from and if, there's, uh, if there are any birds that you can hear or see in your backyard at the moment, that'd be uh, really interesting for us to see as we move along as well. Uh, so we've got some special guests joining us today. Um, one of them is tuning in from uh, Newcastle, I believe, who's Mick Roderick, who is a uh, Woodland Birds for Biodiversity Project Coordinator with BirdLife Australia. And BirdLife Australia is also running the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. And uh, he's an expert on woodland birds and uh, lives in a great part of the world and lots of woodland birds to enjoy and experience in the Hunter Valley. And uh, he has done a lot of research and field work with Regent honey eaters and swift parrots over the years. So we'll um, cut to him in a few minutes. Uh, we also have Jed Field, who's on the, uh, the board of the uh, Central Coast Wetlands Pioneer Dairy Trust here. And he'll be here to tell us all about a special site here and what we can see and how it's managed and um, how people can come along and visit and get involved. And we also have Alan Benson from the Central Coast Group of Birdie New South Wales who's a local bird watching expert and uh, has spent a lot of time traveling around Australia and the world um, bird watching and twitching. So uh, before we go on too much further I'd like to um, talk about the app. So this week it's really easy for people all around Australia to upload sightings and recordings of birds that they see uh, in their backyard or at their local park or local wetland or reserve. And you can either do that through the um, Aussie Backyard Bird Count app, which as I said, is free to download. Uh, and you can also, if you don't have a phone or an ability to um, access or download apps, you can also go to the website, um, the Backyard Bird Count website, which we have uh, the link for at the end of the webinar that we can put up on the screen. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to introduce Mick Roderick. Can you hear me, Mick? I can, Nick. How are you going? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. Um, so just to start off a little bit about yourself, if that's okay. Um, firstly, do you have a favourite bird? Ooh. <laughs> I would have to say Regent Honey, otherwise I'd get in a bit of trouble. But uh, my other favourite bird would have to be the Gould's Petrel. Um, oh, wow. a, yeah, an endangered seabird that um, there's two subspecies and one of those subspecies until recently only bred on the island of Port Stephens, just, in, just north of Newcastle. And we've done some really exciting work in recent times, putting some nest boxes on Broughton Island and yeah, we had some great success. So yeah, Gould's Petrol and Regent Honey are half and half. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, you also are lucky enough to uh, make birding uh, your career and your profession now. So, and just quickly, how did you get into birding or bird watching and the outdoors and nature in general? Yeah, it's a good question. A lot of people assume that I sort of grew up in a bird watching family, but that wasn't really the case. My family was certainly, you know, we did bushwalks and went camping and things like that. It wasn't until university when I studied ecology. Um, within an environmental management degree that I really clicked with uh, nature and uh, particularly bird watching. A few of the mates at uni, instead of going surfing, we went bird watching and, you know, we had rivalry between the different field guides and it was heaps of fun. And, and you know, from there, I've just managed to somehow make uh, birding, you know, sort of massaged birding into my career. So I'm very fortunate. Yeah, fantastic. And so as we've mentioned today uh, is, 
right in the middle of um, National Bird Week and we've got a big focus on the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. So uh, it'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about it and just quickly explain how easy it is for everyone to uh, get involved and um, take part in it. Yeah, sure. No, no worries. Well, I start sharing my screen and, and talking you through it. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so even though I am mostly involved with threatened woodland birds, I'm really excited to to help promote the bird count because it's a, a really fantastic way for for people who aren't normally bird watchers to become bird watchers for a week. People like myself and and Nick and Alan, you know, we're out there. Um, submitting bird lists uh, most of the year, maybe all of the year. <laughs> uh, but this week is really all about trying to get other people involved. And, you know, if, if the interest does spark, then you're certainly more than welcome to, to stay involved. There's a number of ways that people can submit lists in, in other ways outside of the Backyard Bird Count. Um, but so the Backyard Bird Count, as we know, is happening this week. Um, we're up to, you know, Thursday. So we're, we're sort of past the half way mark. Um, just a brief bit of background about BirdLife Australia. So we're one of Australia's largest not-for-profit bird conservation organisations, uh, about 120 years old. And we've got a, an enormous uh, membership and, and supporter base of around 180,000 people. So we're, we're very active in seeking the support of the community in the work that we do. We have 33 branches and special interest groups spread around the country and the Central Coast is certainly a, a great supporter of, of bird life's work. So really the aims of the Backyard Bird Count is to, just, like, I, like I mentioned before, to engage the broader community um, to participate in, in, in bird watching. Uh, we all think bird watching is great, uh, but it isn't just about bird watching, it's really about experiencing the birds and it, it isn't always just about what birds are on a, a list either. It's also about what the birds are doing. It's a great way of, of observing nature. Um, if we tried to do this with frogs or bats or something, it would be really difficult. But birds, birds are diurnal. Birds are awake during the day and they occur in every habitat. So in other words, birds are always around us. So it's a really great way of contributing to citizen science is by getting involved with things such as the, the bird count. And over time, as all these records come in, it, be, it does become valuable data that BirdLife Australia can use to, to actually see what's going on in our backyards with, with, with our birds. And so, yep, it's, it sits within Bird Week. So Bird Week happens in about the third or fourth week of October each year. That's deliberate. So October in Australia is a really important month for birds because it's, it's a time when our resident birds are breeding, but it's also a, a time when the spring migrants have returned from being up north to come back south to, to also breed. So it's a, a really exciting time for, for, for birds and bird watchers. So as Nick has mentioned, uh, to, to get involved, uh, it's as simple as downloading a free app, or you can also enter records uh, on, a, on a website. Uh, and one of the beauties of the, the Backyard Bird Count app is that it has a built-in, uh, like a, almost a field guide function. So if you're not sure about what you're, what you're looking at, you can plug in a few clues to arrive at, a, at an identification. So there's just a couple of screen grabs there um, of what the, the app looks like. So you basically download the app, you get started. Uh, you can see there's a button there for, for the field guide. Um, and then it's really just a, a matter of choosing a place to, to enter your 20 minute survey. It doesn't necessarily have to be your backyard. You can go to a local park, you can go to your local patch of bush. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's, it's 20 minutes, uh, that's deliberate. So the fact that we make all these uh, lists and surveys the same period of time means that we can actually compare information across the country. And you just fill in a few fields there. Um, one of those actually asks you about your birding experience as well, to, whether you're a, a novice or whether you're an advanced birder. Uh, as you go in to type in the names of birds, as soon as you start tapping on the letters, um, names will start coming up. So you, you never will actually have to uh, write out the entire name of a bird. So once you, if you wanted to select Australian magpie, you can see there, all you need to, t I mean, really probably MAG is probably enough and then magpie will come up and you just click on that, um, goes into the list. 
Uh, and this is a, a screenshot of the field guide section. So if you're not sure, you just sort of um, plug in some variables about the size of the bird, the shape of the birds and colors. And then at the end, there'll be um, some, uh, you know, a, a bird will pop up and hopefully that's uh, what, you, what you've looked at. And there's also some information there about, about that species to help you um, confirm or otherwise if that's the bird that you've seen or heard. Then you move through to the submit um, screen, um, submit the list and you're away. So it's, it's that simple. Uh, there is actually a YouTube uh, how-to video online uh, for, for people who, who aren't sure how to, how to do all this. Um, I'm not an app person at all, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can function this one and, and the bird data apps, they're, they're actually very, very easy. So if I can do it, anyone can do it really. Uh, just some, some really brief um, background to what's happened in, in recent years. So, so last year we had uh, nearly 3.4 million birds uh, counted across Australia in the backyard bird count and nearly 90,000 people took, took part. So as, as always, we're trying to beat um, last year's record. I think we got 2.7 million in 2018. Um, so yeah, so each year we're trying to outdo the, the last and, and as we speak, I think we're floating around the 2.6 million um, mark for, for birds uh, submitted so far. Um, it probably comes as no surprise uh, that uh, rainbow lorikeets, noisy miners and, and magpies round out the, the top three. Um, and that in New South Wales, we also have things like sulfur crested cockatoos. Uh, but I should say that 2020, let's face it, there's, there's absolutely nothing normal about 2020. Uh, but with, the, with the, the, the impacts of the fires, which have happened since the last bird count, and also the impacts of the rains that we got in late summer, um, that we could actually see some very different results this year. So it's really important that we get as many lists as possible submitted. And I've just, um, I've just went to the, the live stats and quickly grabbed a couple of postcodes there. So there's Gosford and Wyong postcodes. So between, between them, we've got about 540 odd um, lists submitted already and about, um, yeah, eight and a half thousand um, sightings. So that's fantastic. Uh, and there's still plenty of time to, to get in and submit some more, some more lists. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to promote the bird count and yeah, looking forward to some questions and yeah, uh, back to you, Nick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and as I mentioned again, I've had quite a few comments from people over the last uh, few days that um, how much people have enjoyed just sitting outside and taking 20 minutes out of their day to sit down and quietly uh, take in the birds that they can hear and see and actually notice things that are around. And if you do it um, each day of the week and uh, you might get addicted to it and keep doing it all year. Um, <laughs> Be careful. Also, yeah. Also, you'll... Uh, you'll notice changes as well if you do it at different times of day or different days of the week, depending on the weather or other things. Um, right. You might get some special birds just happen to be flying over. Um, I had a white-bellied seagull flying over my house, so that's a good one for my backyard list um, from yesterday. Fantastic. So, yeah, so. All right, uh, thank you, Mick. We'll uh, introduce our next guest now. His name is Jed Field, who's a ecologist and he's uh, been heavily involved here at Central Coast Wetlands for a long time. Uh, in a voluntary capacity and um, yeah we're lucky to have him today to uh, Thanks, Nick. tell us a lot more about the site here so I guess before I talk about the site because um, we're all talking about birds today and um, you can probably tell that I love birds and like talking about birds so um, firstly Jed do you, are you a, a birder or a bird watcher? I love watching birds and I love when you're still somewhere and the birds come to you and this site is a great site for bird watching because it's the public accessible areas make it so easy to see so many species and a range of different species because of the variety of habitat we have out here. Yeah, fantastic. And do you have a favourite bird at all yourself? Uh, it probably varies depending on the season. I had a glimpse of a blue face honey eater a couple of weeks ago. Right. That's special for me. I love seeing yeah. that blue flash. Yeah. Yep. And they're pretty... Uh, uncommon on the central coast. Yeah, as well. that's so, right. Yeah, it's yeah. always exciting to see them. That's right. So, can you tell us a little bit more about Central Coast Wetlands? Its history, obviously, uh, uh, 100 years or so ago, was uh, started as a dairy. 
Yeah, that's uh, right. Can you tell us a bit more about that? It's got a really intensive agriculture history, um, this reserve. So it was previously a dairy farm and it came into government ownership around the year 2000. And at that time, the reserve was gazetted for um, recreation and coastal environmental protection. And those two things are really important here and they go hand in hand. And, and the, there's currently a board that's um, looking after the day-to-day -day management of the land. Um, this site is um, extremely, a range of niche habitats. So we've got um, behind us the dairy swamp, which is a large freshwater wetland. Um, one of the only ex examples of this kind of habitat in the Central Coast. In terms of um, cattle, we have grazing the edges, and that's actually really important because it maintains that open wetland vista that helps um, support migratory waders that don't like timbered woodlands. They like the open um, wetland vista because they can see the predators. And uh, also we have, um, we support a lot of threatened species, um, including raptors. And just recently, I, as in months ago, I had a powerful owl um, in one of our riparian corridors. And that goes to show what we're doing out here is working. And we're doing a lot out here. And yeah, that's reliant a lot on volunteers. Um, yeah, with tree planting projects and, and management prescriptions to make sure this place is, is here for the wildlife. Yeah, fantastic. So also know that um, many, many thousands of trees have been planted here over the, the 20 years. Yeah. Um, and some of those have been planted specifically for particular birds? Absolutely. Um, so um, thousands, hundreds of thousands, in fact, 200,000 trees wow. approximately have been planted out here over the last 15 years. Only the last 15 years, this place was, was basically um, paddocks with a couple of remnant trees around. And now we've got living and breathing forests. And we've got species of birds moving in um, that haven't been seen here before in European history. So it's, that's really exciting. Yeah, and fantastic that, you know, we're in Tugger, it's, um, you can, might, viewers might occasionally hear trains going past here and we're really close to Tugger Westfields, for example. And uh, maybe some viewers don't know that the site is here, but it's um, very special and lucky to have it right here. Uh, and also, um, uh, is the wetland here open to the public to come along and visit? It is, it's open seven days a week. Um, so we're located um, between Wyong River and the Tugger Railway Station. So access is from South Tacoma Road. Um, yeah, we've, we're under a gazebo here. This is an awesome elevated space to look over the dairy swamp and look at water birds. We, um, we've got a number of walking trails around here and picnic facilities. So it's a great place to come out here, bring your app and log your sightings um, because that, that information too really informs, helps inform the management of this site and how we're restoring habitat, which habitat we're restoring for which species. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, definitely have been a lot of really rare and amazing birds turn up here over the years that have got a lot of uh, people from Central Coast and even yeah. Sydney coming people up here to see them. People flock here. <laughs> they really do from Newcastle to Sydney um, because we do have some rare visitors like the black neck stork. And that's when it's here, it's the tallest bird on the wetland. It's, it's over a metre tall. It stands out. Um, and that species comes from um, northern areas of Australia. So to have that down here, um, it is special. Yeah, and it shows that with the habitat here is really important. Yeah, and it's amazing uh, to come and watch them here. And I've seen one out here um, catching eels and gulping them down holes. So yeah, it's pretty yeah, amazing. that's right. And the white-bellied seagulls love um, this open wetland too because they've, they're hunting for the eels. And and there's plenty in here. As we've been here today, we've, we've heard some splashing around. Yeah, probably eels. Lots of big fish out there as well. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, with the trees that have been planted, so you said around about 200,000 trees and mm. that's all been done by volunteers, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so everything here's been done by volunteers. I'm a volunteer here and we're still going. We're, so our habitat restoration is focused on um, creek lines and buffering those creek lines, getting the stock out of the creek lines and um, planting trees along those corridors, which is increasing um, habitat connectivity but also providing a range of habitat that support um, not just wetland birds, but, but species that like forested wetlands. 
yeah, and a lot of that water is obviously flowing through suburban areas, and industrial this, areas of Tugger. So this, this site benefits the whole catchment. It's, it, it's yeah. filtering water and providing water quality. Yeah, exactly. So it's improving the water quality in Tugger Lakes and Wyong River as well as yeah. locally right here on site. Yeah, too. that's right. All right. Thanks, Jed. That was fantastic. What we'd like to do now is uh, screen a video. So a couple of years ago, Central Coast Council put together a video about uh, the Regent Honey Eater, which has been recorded here in the past, uh, critically endangered species um, that Mick Roderick uh, mentioned earlier as well. And um, one of the main reasons that some of the species of trees were planted here, such as the swamp mahogany, was because they're a winter flowering tree that um, benefits the Regent Honey Eater if they visit the Central Coast in winter. So we can uh, pass over to that video now with um, Ash and Andy, our technical crew in the background there, and we'll listen to that. Oh, look, there's one. Oh, look at their amazing colours. Oh, see the next. The beautiful Regent Honey Eater was once a common sight in the forest and woodlands of South East Australia. However, they are now listed as critically endangered. The Regent Honey Eaters declined because of habitat loss on the tablelands and slopes of New South Wales. Because of the loss of habitat, everything's cramming for the same small amount of resource. The forests surrounding Tugger Lakes provide important habitat and a winter food source for Regent Honey Eaters and Swift Parrots. This is one of the reasons the lakes has been designated a key biodiversity area. A dedicated group of volunteers at Central Coast Wetlands Tugra have been working hard to create new habitat for these special birds. They set up a nursery, we collected the seed on site, we collected seeds from 49 different plants, grew them on site, then planted those seedlings in, and over 110,000 trees and shrubs have been planted on this site. Planting trees also stabilises the soil and reduces stormwater runoff. This new forest at Tugra is helping to improve the water quality in Tugra Lakes. The Wild Plant Community Nursery specialises in the supply of local provenance plants from the Central Coast with the aim of putting those plants back in the local bushland. Taronga Zoo has been breeding region honey eaters to boost the population in the wild. The Chatsy Breed and Release Program here at Taronga has been going since 2008 and we've released 295 birds into the wild. So after we release them, they're monitored by a group of volunteers. If the Regent Honey Eater population is to recover, we need more habitat and we need to learn more about where the birds go. We can all do our bit to help! Volunteer with the Central Coast Wetlands or the Wild Plant Community Nursery, join a land care group, take part in the Regent Honey Eater surveys. For more information, download Central Coast Council's multi-touch books from iTunes. All right, so great video there to uh, give us a bit more of an overview of the wetlands and especially those drone shots there really give you an idea of the size of the land here and just how many trees have been planted. And you can see all the trees, especially on the creek lines there, which, um, yeah, as Jed said, are really fantastic for habitat, not only for, I guess, the target species they're planted for, but then all kinds of animals that um, move in afterwards as well, from insects to birds and mammals. All right, so we'll move on now to our next guest, Alan Benton from the Central Coast Group of Birdie New South Wales, who's a very knowledgeable, experienced and well-traveled birder. Uh, I think he's traveled probably to every corner of Australia pretty much to see as many different birds as he can. And uh, over his lifetime, he's seen around about 800 species. Is that correct? That's correct, Nick. 806 to be exact. 806, okay. Wouldn't want to sell you short there. <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure you've got lots of amazing stories and uh, adventures that have uh, you've experienced along the way with, you know, with your family and friends. Uh, do you have any particular favourite experiences or birds? Well, um, as you said, I've been to a lot of places in Australia, and it's been an experience to go to some of those remote places. And uh, just as an example, I saw my 600th bird on Christmas Island. I was, no, sorry, on Iron Range in Cape York. My 700th in no, I've got the wrong way around. No, the 700th in Christmas Island, my 800th was in Western Australia. So I've been to Ashmore Reef, I've been to Kangaroo Island, I've been to Lord Howe Island, I've been to Norfolk Island, I've been to Torres Strait, I've been to lots of lots of interesting places. So it's amazing where birding takes you. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, on the Central Coast, we've got um, a lot of different species. I think um, in any given year, if you if you put in a little bit, bit of effort, you, you could see 
you know, over 250 species. That's true. Right. And um, lots of different habitats. Do you have any particular favourite birding spots on the Central Coast? Yeah, look, um, my favourite birding spot on the on the Central Coast is is the RTA Reserve, which is uh, which is um, a land care area uh, just the other side of the expressway off Arimba Creek Road. It's a mixture of rainforest and more open forest and some wonderful birds turn up there from time to time and the land care group do a fantastic job as well. And you've asked everyone else what their favourite bird is. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to say it's the uh, male region bowerbird. So even right. though that's not an uncommon bird and I'd see it six, seven times a year, it takes my breath away every time I see it. It's just a spectacular bird of, of black and yellow and black and gold. It's, um, it's just a wonderful bird and that's one of the places you see um, region bow, region bow birds is, is the RTA reserve, for example. But no, this is another favourite spot of mine. Um, it's a great spot to come. Over the years, there's been some rarities turn up here, as you mentioned before, some of the rarer waders like um, wood sandpipers and pectoral sandpipers, etc. cetera. Um, but we get some good birds here and it's, it's an easy place to bird and there's a variety of habitats here as well. Yeah, so um, while we've been speaking here today on the webinar, um, you've been looking around at what birds are around here and doing a Aussie backyard bird count. So yep. um, also while we talk, if we have the chance, uh, Ash in the background here um, can put up some photos of some of the birds we'll talk about quickly. So uh, is there anything interesting that you've seen out here in the last 20 minutes? Um, We've seen a white-bellied seagull, which was nice. Um, a, t uh, a top my pigeon flew into the end of the fig trees behind us. The fig birds are calling in there. We've got a lot of water birds. We've got a stack of pelicans out there. There's um, a black swan with two cygnets. Um, the striped honey are calling. There's a coal calling, which we'll, we'll talk about later, I gather. Yeah. Want to put the shot of the coal up? Sure. Um, I think Ash has a shot of a Eastern coel, or a common coel, as um, people sometimes call them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're a very, very noisy springtime visitor. Uh, people, they drive people crazy because they seem to call day and night. They become relatively more common on the coast because they're a cuckoo, which means they're a parasite, and they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And the common bird that they parasite are, are wattle birds and little wattle birds, and they've become more common on the coast as, as people have you know, put grevilleas and and other flowering trees into their gardens and they're quite aggressive honey eaters and, and so they've become more common and therefore the culls have become more common as well. Okay. The other visitor we get is the um, channel bill cuckoo which is, which is an amazing well, bird yeah. because it's got this huge bill and it makes this really raucous call as well and interestingly enough it's become more common on the central coast as well because it's most common bird that its parasites is pied currawongs. Now in times going back we never used to get pied currawongs on the coast in winter but in summer sorry. So as the privets become more prolific and the and the uh, currawongs feed on the privet then we're getting more uh, channel bill cookers on the coast as well. Mm. Um, we've got plenty of cormorants here. We've got shots of cormorants. Ash. Yes we've got a little black cormorant and the great cormorant that we have yeah. often sit on the fence over there but they're not sitting there right no, now. No but this, I've, seen, I've seen both today so that, that's an interesting bird and um, Jeb mentioned the black neck stork which is a really um, spectacular bird and um, there seems to be a, a pair hanging around the coast at, at the moment which is good maybe they, they used to breed on the coast uh, going back in time and probably back in the 20s uh, their, their range is, has um, gone further north. They breed up in Hexham and, and Tomago and places like that in the Hunter. Hopefully they might, they might breed down here as well so that, that would be nice. It's interesting with global warming that we're actually seeing more species on the coast than we used to see and the example of that is the osprey and they were a rare bird 20 years ago. Now we've got about seven or eight pairs breeding on the coast. Um, often on council property you'll be pleased to know such as at um, Mariner Stadium at the um, Yerina uh, Works Depot where and they built a special platform, council built a special platform for them at, um, at Mariners and also a special platform at the Works Depot. They're also at South King, King Campbell Series Treatment Works and there's some up further north as well. Yeah, I actually went and look at the uh, nest on Riley's Island in Brisbane Water yesterday. I think there was two ospreys sitting on top of that. So, so you yeah. think, think they've got eggs or? or uh, it was very hard to see. It was a long way away and it was yeah. 
seven o'clock at night. So, yeah, yeah. But uh, they were sitting there that night, seeing yeah. that sunset. So, so hopefully, they've become more common. We're also getting birds like Brahmini kites, which we didn't, which which are still relatively rare on the coast, but they've been sighted regularly this year. We never used to get them at all. Uh, noisy pitter was a bird we only used to get it in 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 autumn. They're a very spectacular bird if you can see those. They're a rainforest bird. Now they're breeding on the central coast. So you know it's as things warm up, we're we're seeing a different range of birds, and maybe that's the story of the black neck storks as well. That they'll um you know that they'll come down here and breed, which would be would be fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have a picture of a pelican there, Ash? We've got lots of pelicans there. There's about ten or fifteen roosting over there. Um, a very common common bird on the central coast. Obviously, they have the pelican feeding at um, at the entrance, and that keeps them around because they get fed every day. Uh, I said there's a black swan here as well. And what's interesting with uh, the black swans is that the Tugra Lake system is counted as what's called a, a KBA, Key Biodiversity Area. And the reason for that is 2% of the world's population of black swans can be on Tugra Lake at any given time. There can be up to six or 8,000 on the Tugra Lake system when conditions are right. And the other reason is there's 2% of the world's population of chestnut teal on the Tugra Lake system as well. So that's a really important um, area for uh, natural area. And as you're well aware, the little terns are going to nest again this year, we hope, and they're, they're, they're a vulnerable bird. And council also puts a lot of effort into protecting those birds, uh, building a fence to, so that they don't get disturbed while they're nesting and, and monitoring and doing a good job there as well. Yeah, definitely. And when they're, they've just started arriving in the last couple of weeks, so looking forward to yeah. some breeding happening there. Yeah, I saw 50 in breeding plumage yesterday and there's some courtship behaviour going on. So uh, despite the disturbance of the dredging and everything else that's happened with the channel being opened and, cl opened and closed and then opened again, hopefully they will breed there. Yeah, definitely. And so for people watching um, that would like to get a little bit more involved or find out more about birds on the Central Coast or where to find them or you know, how to identify a bird if they see it in their backyard, if they get a photo or a video recording. Can you tell us a bit more about the Central Coast yeah. Birders? Um, Central Coast Birders is a very active group. Um, we have a monthly meeting at the Progress Hall at Tugra where we have a guest speaker, etc., etc. et cetera. Uh, we do have uh, two outings a month, a half day, half day and a full day outing. Four camp outs a year where we go to various places in the camp, out, camp happening at Sandy Hollow this weekend, for example. Um, if you're just a, in a little bit curious about what goes on, we do have a Facebook page which has got about 550 members and the photographers post their, their photos on it and the sightings get posted on it and it's a good way to keep in touch. If you do go and want to become part of the Facebook site, please follow the directions and answer all the questions, otherwise you won't be on it. Um, if you're interested in, in birds, the simple way is to buy a bird guide. There are, there's a number of good bird guides around. They're about $50. And it's, it's when you're new to birding and you don't know what you're looking at, it's a lot of fun going through a bird guide to saying. And then when you actually find it, it's a nice feeling of satisfaction that you've identified it rather than somebody else said it is, said what it is. Um, a pair of binoculars is a good idea and you can spend from hundred and fifty to three thousand dollars on a pair of binoculars so obviously you get what you pay for but if you are beginning to beginning to birdie don't be spending three thousand dollars on a pair of binoculars but they they are really useful to pick up the field marks and the what of, of the birds that um, that you see mm, fantastic and uh so and it's also great for potentially beginners to go along to some of the outings that you have not only so you can learn how to get to and where to go at particular sites but also you know get to talk to people and help uh identify them and ask questions as well yep and that's right um you know the, you, one you learn the, the good sites to go by yourself but two you get a bit of a guide of how of how to um, identify the birds uh, learn some of the bird calls which is a really important aspect of, of birding um, modern birding these days is about bird photography um, digital cameras have become relatively cheap maybe going back in the days of slide films, you, you'd be selective of how many pictures you take. These days they can fire up hundreds and get one good photo. So it, it adds a whole new dimension to bird watching or birding. And a lot of our uh, now good bird watchers have, have come to bird watching through or being birding through photography. And, uh, and, and the photographers do the same thing that the twitchers do. They're trying to get a photo of every bird or they're trying to get the optimal photo of a, of a particular species. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so much, so many different avenues of birding as well. And yeah. 
Uh, I've also got the, the New South Wales Twitchathon coming up next weekend as well. So that's another way for people to get involved for the uh, not only the keen twitches, but also people who just like to um, get out and have a relaxing couple of hours birding. There's different sections of the race. Yeah, there's, there's the full on twitchathon, the 30 hour one, which is taken very seriously. But there's, as you said, there's also the more relaxed. It's basically a uh, fundraising activity. Um, and, and this year the funds are going to um, uh, do some more studies into what is the only endemic bird in the Sydney region, which is the rock warbler or the, the rock warbler, which occurs in an area on the sandstone area. And, and we do get them on the central coast. They're not common, but, they, but you can find them. Uh, and they're a very cute little bird um, in a very restricted habitat. So a bird that could be under pressure if, if it gets overdeveloped, but that's, that's, why, that's why the funds are going to that. Yeah, awesome. All right, do we have any questions that have come through recently, Ash or any? Nothing new? No. no? Okay. Well, if anyone does have any, uh, feel free to send them through shortly. We're about to wrap it up. But um, before we finish, uh, I'd just like to remind everyone uh, to get out there and do some birding. 20 minutes is uh, not long to take. You can do it in your lunch break. You can do it before work or after work. Or now with daylight savings, it's great. You can even, you can even uh, do it while you're having dinner on the veranda or something like that. Uh, and, yeah, don't just... Uh, do your bird counting during National Bird Week. You can obviously do it any time of the year through other apps, the eBird app or the Bird Data app, which are free to download as well. And they're also great to look up. You can look up where certain birds have been found, um, which helps you to go and find new interesting places as well. Uh, so also like to thank the photographers. I had some uh, local photographers send through some beautiful photos that Ash has shared while Alan's been speaking. So I'd like to thank uh, Daniel McEwen, Christina Port, uh, Jared Satterley, Jeff White, Nicola Markovina and Warren Chad for sending through and letting us use those photos. And I uh, hope everyone enjoyed watching our webinar today and hopefully learned something new. And uh, yeah, hope to uh, see you out and about birding on the Central Coast shortly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks everyone.